and Christopher Driscoll, a scholar of religion, culture, and spirituality. This video continues lesson three, exploring the key philosophers and their ideas that shape the Is God Dead discussion. The thinkers we're discussing in lesson three include Rene Descartes, David Hume, Ludwig Feuerbach, and Karl Marx. Now, these are all famous philosophers in their own right, and each was invested in the topic of God and religion. And therefore, they shaped what will become the Is God Dead discourse. Now, in order to better meet your needs, I'm presenting Lesson 3 as four distinct videos on YouTube. This way, each video will be much shorter, and those of you who are here to learn about one of these thinkers will not need to watch a much longer video. And this time around, I'm also adding some ever so slight ASMR triggers for those of you here for the ASMR. This part three of the lesson covers the thinking of German philosopher Ludwig Feuerbach. Feuerbach died in 1872, to give you some context. He's remembered for teaching us that theology is anthropology, meaning that anything we say or do or believe about God always has a bearing on human culture. It also means that anything we say or do or believe about humans will necessarily be impacted by the idea of God, whether that's by God directly or because other people believe in God. In the middle of the 19th century, Feuerbach offered one of the first projection theories of religion. This is a reductive theory that suggests theology, like I said, is ultimately anthropology. What we say about God actually has to do with human needs, desires, and mental processes. If you need to catch up on the previous lessons, click the link up top or in the description and you can find lessons one and two and the first parts of lesson three. Otherwise, let's dive in. The effects of Descartes and Hume and others was to start an ongoing conversation about God as an option or mere proposition. And that's ebbed and flowed for centuries across the Western world. At some points, different versions of belief would be in fashion, while at other times, atheism was all the rage. Now across this time, a new way of studying religion slowly emerged. This perspective we call reductionism, and it refers to the idea that religious beliefs and practices can be explained in terms of other motivators. God doesn't actually compel me to go to church on Sundays. Rather, I want to increase my social networks so I make up a story about needing to go to church on Sunday. God takes the pretense out of that social event. That's an example of how religion is reduced to its fundamental human dimensions. Some of the most famous reductionists are Emil Durkheim, Sigmund Freud, and Karl Marx, Friedrich Nietzsche, but before them all, there was Ludwig Feuerbach. 
so a little background is helpful. Kant and Hegel in the previous century had basically offered the two philosophical systems that sought to synthesize a priori and a posteriori knowledge. Kant told us that we have to pretend that these kinds of knowledge are connected through what he called a transcendental signifier or subject, that is, God, but emphasized that God was synthetic. Basically, for Kant, he was telling us that we fake belief in God so that we can feel like we know things, so that we can get things done. You know, Feuerbach, he's what was remembered as a left Hegelian. And so the impact of Hegel's thinking had a huge influence on Feuerbach's work. Hegel suggested that God moves in and as history. And so because of that, at any moment in history, we're seeing the highest expression of God. This was what the dialectic showed us. Feuerbach disagreed with Hegel on this idea. Hegel, on the other hand, said that God was history. When we look to God or appeal to God, we're appealing to history. The young or the left Hegelians took this idea and ran with it. But they disagreed with Hegel on a subtle but important point that God in history had reached its most perfect expression. They kept what he called his dialectical process, but argued that while God may be history, history is screwed up. And so they couldn't accept the fact that the final revealing of God had occurred. Indeed, they took the notion of God as history and said that if God is history, then God is a bad idea. So we better get to work on finding a way to overcome this idea, this history. The philosopher Van Harvey suggested that the young Hegelian Feuerbach stood Hegel on his head. Instead of saying that the absolute spirit, God, achieves self-knowledge by objectifying itself in the finite world, he argued that the finite spirit comes to self-knowledge by externalizing or objectifying itself in the idea of God. Now, Feuerbach was frustrated because the philosophers and the theologians were missing the point of religion, missing its essence. Religion didn't seem to be about anything other than humans orienting themselves towards perfection. Thinking about the songs, religion was a response to human failure, human limits, human smallness. But the problem was, for Feuerbach, that religion seemed to perpetuate those limits, those failures. He was inspired by the work of an earlier thinker named Frederick Schleiermacher. And so he focused his attention on feeling. What Schleiermacher described as a feeling of absolute dependence. It didn't necessitate proof of God or proof that religion was good. But what it did was tell us where to look if we're interested in making sense of religion. The feeling the even of ASMR, the powerful feeling when your hair stands on your neck, forcing you to 
to confront the way that we're all connected much more deeply and, and intimately than we want to admit. Like Schleiermacher, Feuerbach, Feuerbach began with experience and feelings, but he took a different angle. What he sees in religion are humans wrestling with what it means to be human. If religion tells us we're made in the image of God, then we can see the reverse of those terms. That is, religion is the process whereby humans make God. The Imago Dei becomes the Imago Humando, or the Imago Superlata that were made in the image of an exaggeration of ourself. From this Feuerbach's thesis is that religion is ultimately rooted in anthropology, not theology. He says that the concept of a superhuman God is nothing but a projection of the perfected principal attributes of human nature. By deconstructing the supernatural elements of religion, he concluded that religion does not center on God revealing God's infinite nature to us, but rather on human beings discovering our true infinite nature within our humanity. Now, there's not a single reference to God that cannot be reduced to a feature of human desire or expression. And any moments you might think of that could might force you to ask yourself, is it still worth it to call that thing God? Now, I'll break to read something for the philosophical geeks in the house. Feuerbach establishes his argument by framing it within, within the context of human consciousness. Religion stems from this consciousness. He states, quote, In religion, man contemplates his own latent nature. Hence, it must be shown that this antithesis, this differencing of God and man with which religion begins, is a differencing of man with his own nature. This nature is nothing else than the intelligence, the reason, or the understanding. Consciousness, he says, is self-verification, self-affirmation, self-love, and joy in one's own perfection, the characteristic mark of a perfect God, of a perfect nature. This should echo Descartes. It's natural to draw these conclusions for oneself about God, but that doesn't make them right. It does, however, make them human. Each of us are connected to one another through our consciousness and our existence. You know, both lend us to thinking of the infinite. But it's a far stretch from emotional awareness of the infinite and our interconnectedness to anthropomorphizing about an agential God. Feuerbach presents a notion of projection, a process in which man sees his nature as if outside of himself which occurs between subject and object relationships, specifically those found within the confines of Christianity. Within Christianity, as Feuerbach reveals in the first part of the text, God symbolizes an objectification of what he calls the highest powers of humanity that is, our feeling, our will, and our reason. In this projection, God is 
the objectification of our nature. Humans become an object of this projected image. When God is man, man is God. The consciousness of God becomes self-consciousness and knowledge of God becomes self-knowledge. God is the manifested inward nature, the expressed self of a human. Feuerbach believes all this to be normal human behavior. It doesn't become a problem until Christianity specifically turns the essential aspects of humanity into the grounds for charges of idolatry and sin. So concluding, Feuerbach makes his position clear. Man, he says, this is the mystery of religion. When he projects his being into objectivity and then again makes himself an object to this projected image of himself, thus converted into a subject. He thinks of himself as an object to himself, but as the object of an object, as the object of an object, as the object of an object becomes a being other than himself. Man becomes an object of God, making the divine activity a means of salvation. Man has, in fact, no other aim than himself within that process. Divine activity becomes indistinguishable from human activity. Now, in many ways, Feuerbach may be the most significant theorist that we learn about in this course. And the reason is because after him, we're no longer able to ignore the relationship between theology and anthropology. Effectively, his projection theory establishes that projection is a metaphysical property of human life. What I mean is that from this point forward, we have to contend with the religious beliefs of other people. And we have to accept that the beliefs that we and other people hold about God or gods have an impact on us as humans, whether we want them to or not. But think of it this way. Many people vote today based on religious convictions. Many have opinions about issues like abortion and other things because of their belief in God. You or I may be an atheist, but that doesn't mean that other people's beliefs will not impact us. Simply disbelieving in the idea of God is not enough to kill that idea fully. Think of it this way. God believes in us whether or not we want to believe in God. Claiming that theology is anthropology is not a mere reduction of theology to anthropology. Many misread Feuerbach in saying that. But no, to suggest that theology is anthropology is in fact to emphasize the intrinsic a priori relationship between experiences in our physical world and the ideas we hold about that world within ourselves. Ironically, in showing us the connection between God and humans as it exists in our imagination, Feuerbach succeeds where Descartes fails. The connection is intrinsic, but not based on the experience of God or the rational proof of God. Rather, God is the personification of human capacity, and we all share in the tendency to imagine superlative expressions of our abilities, of our desires and dreams. Calling that connection God gets in the way of our understanding of who we are and who we are capable of becoming. 
And it's for that reason, Feuerbach wants to get rid of the idea of God. He's not the only philosopher calling God a problem. And to his more famous left Hegelian counterpart, we turn next to Karl Marx. So join us for the last section of Lesson 3 in this free online education course, Is God Dead? Thank you for being here. I'm Christopher Driscoll, and I'm grateful for your time here. And we'll see you in the next section of Lesson 3.